Okay, good morning, everyone. Today we are still continuing our discussion on visualizations. I think we have at least one more week. And um, uh, in this, uh, today might be a little boring, sorry for that, but you know, some parts of the course is like a dictionary, you should go through some concepts and define them. But at least each week we have one uh, day of lab, virtual lab actually. So we go over uh, softwares and uh, yeah, what I mean, next Wednesday, please have a Tableau open on your laptop. So when I go through Tableau, uh, you can follow my instructions. If you miss some parts, I know it, it might be some challenging due to COVID, but, and you are not on campus, but uh, as I said, uh, I uh, record the video so later you can pause the video and just be sure that you can follow me. Any questions from previous cl uh, classes? No. Okay, good. I think I remember uh, it was a question that some of you emailed me about the optional reading. The optional reading was a, ch a chapter of a book. So, um, you know, each school or each department has access to some uh, basically website that provides documents for us. Since you are, uh, many of you probably are off campus, it might be a little uh, challenging to reach those data sets. But Eli uh, Clark Eliot, which stands for Interline uh, Library Lo Loan System, helps you to ask the library to send you some documents. Let me see if I can find it. Oh no, that's over. Oh, let me share my screen. So just go Google and search for Ilya at Clark University. Just Google it. And you see such a link. Again, those readings are optional. You don't have to read, but I think they are some of the really good sources. Also, uh, for your research, I mean, uh, what I mean research, your final project, you need to reference some of your uh, phrases so you need to reach some papers so Iliad helps you to get those papers and use them for your final project but anyway search for uh, Iliad Clark University request just click on the first thing because of library materials and come to interlibrary loan click submit a request you need to log in with your Clark credentials and you go to where is the new request let me see okay new request so it could be article book a uh, book chapter so the optional reading that you had was a book chapter so you click on it and i think here you just need to talk about title of the book the date that you want it and also the chapter. Okay, so publication. Some of them helps, but I think chapter title this okay. That you should put the chapter title here, book name, and the date that the remaining are optional, and then you submit request and university will send you an email that has documents that you want. Again, it could be paper, book chapters, or so on and so forth. Okay, so um, I mean, later this week I post a homework which you haven't had so far because I need to teach on Wednesday. So after Wednesday, you have a homework based on a tablet that I'm going to teach. And also keep in mind, you have first project delivery on March 22nd. And um, basically, 
you need to talk about your problem statement, motivation, and importance of your study, and data set, uh, which, and also the description of the variables. But again, um, you might change your project later because you, uh, you would get more understanding about the materials that I'm going to teach. So no worries, just don't miss this deadline, submit your uh, first uh, project deliverable, then later again, you are flexible to change even topic and the uh, data set. Okay, oh, my screen, let me change to, I guess you should, now you should see my PowerPoint, yeah. So, okay, last week, we had some visualization ex examples. You might you remember some of them was even artistic. Uh, we talk about the, uh, developing exploratory questions. Imp and we talk about the importance of storytelling. Basically, you are not robots and they want to hire some smart people can, that can have deliver useful visualizations. As we said, those visualizations should be smart, but very simplistic. And also, you should be able to explain those visualizations very well. And talk about different type of visualizations and also uh, we use Tableau to visualize them. Also I talk about uh, informs uh, institutions. Uh, I mean, it's the most prestigious institution in analytics field. So if you're, if you next year, I think this year may not be very useful, but if you're graduating next year, I recommend to join these institutions uh, for two reasons. I mean, next year annual meeting, you can go there and you meet, uh, I mean, HRs of the, the most prestigious companies such as Walmart, Amazon, Facebook, Google, uh, you name it. So all of them comes for hiring. Also, if you are a PhD, you want to apply for PhD, you should join now and you should, you should do some research by the end of summer. So you can submit your research and later present in the conference. Some of your uh, good friends got PhD admissions. I think Auburn, uh, Massachusetts, Amherst and other schools. So they also were active for, uh, they were active in the informs. But if you join late, you cannot prepare a presentation, you cannot submit it or you cannot be a part of it and the, uh, like, the enrollment fee is very cheap. Uh, I think it should be less than 50 bucks. Uh, for more information, please contact Jade. She already had admission, or at least one admission for, uh, for her PhD. So she can talk about it. But even this year was really challenging for people to get the admission because of COVID. So I provide her information. Also, we have... Um, Hackathon, I forgot to talk about it last week. So basically it's an alcohol competition. I'm not exactly sure when is the date, but I think if they post it in the, almost at the end of semester, all the students could attend, but this course, I teach you uh, enough tools to attend that hackathon. What I propose to them uh, this year, uh, you'd make some models to predict Bitcoin prices, just in case you might do interested to do daily trading. So using the tools that you learn in this course and to predicting Bitcoin price for the next day, but they might change the topic. I'm not very sure. Okay, let me show you part of your model. Um, So, okay, this is your model. I already have posted, have all of the weeks, but for this, you cannot see, you just see by week three. Go to sample posters. Just in case, if it's an in-person competition, I posted some good examples of presentation in the, I mean, last years. So you can see what, what other uh, friends did. So let me look at, for example, 
one of them. Not this one. I just opened one of them randomly. As you see, for being successful in uh, such a competitions, you need to use cool visualization. So uh, I think you learn most of it this semester. So it's about business intelligence in the banking industry and they showed the um, basically data flow challenges, uh, like about credit cards and job segments. So uh, it's a really cool one. Also, I recommend to reduce number of uh, amount of text. Maybe if they could reduce the amount of text here, uh, that would be better. But I, frankly speaking, it's a really good uh, presentation. Versus this one. This is actually a good one. I don't say it's a bad presentation, but as you see, there's too many texts. So in such a competitions, when people look at your poster, they might lose some of their interest because of uh, they don't have that much of time to read all of the text. So even good visualization help you to compete in such a analytical challenges. If you submit your final report, you need to put a lot of text, but for a poster, more visualization, less text is better. So let's see what you guys do this year. Hopefully, if they put it at the end of semester, I think many of you could be vaccinated. So maybe we could have an on-campus one. Okay, this week uh, we have we will have more ex examples and like we have we, we go over some concepts and uh, basically at the end of the week which is next class uh, I, I teach you more uh, visualizations skills through tableau okay here i put the uh, two links for a uh, basically same topic is about uh, Deloitte and Tableau that work together to make, uh, to bring analytics for uh, tax purposes. So basically uh, they made a kind of software that, that can look at the current financial uh, transactions and give you good insights. What are you doing in, uh, in terms of tax? which part of your company basically might build money or some of them are more profitable. And basically you don't have to wait uh, to the end, by the end of the year and just uh, bring so many experts, work hard and just give you the, your tax performance. You can do online or uh, basically day-to-day -day tax analytics and understand what is going on in your system. So as you might, no, I'm not sure how many years we have been in US, but we are uh, getting to the due date of tax preparation. So if you work in the US, most likely you, you finish your tax preparation so far or haven't, you should do it fast. Otherwise you miss the due date. For me, doing tax is really a nightmare. Some people are expert in it, but frankly speaking, it needs a lot of effort and takes a lot of time. If you have a software that gives you day by day your tax situation and you can't basically embed it in your enterprise resource planning softwares or ERPs or other accounting platforms is really useful. Uh, and uh, basically many companies get to problems because of uh, like amount of time that they need to spend for preparing the documents. Also, you might remember uh, the last president, he also uh, claimed, I mean, blamed, he didn't want, I think he didn't want to release his tax document due to some basically processing. And he just saying that 
many people are working on it. It's a complicated process, but anyway, it's, you might remember the la last president had issues in releasing his uh, tax documents. I recommend to read through these two links and it gives you more insights about the collaboration between Deloitte and also uh, Tableau and how they uh, did about the specification of softwares and the advantage of it. In this chart, you can see, um, I mean, the questions or challenges uh, that you might have about tax in different sections, like indirect tax, um, tax provision, or income tax compliance. For example, just look at the uh, question, are the cash taxes paid in each jurisdiction appropriate relative to the projected tax table income and statutory, statutory tax rates? And that's actually a difficult question. I mean, I think if, if you don't have such a software, it might take days to just answer that question. Or about uh, f federal or state or international tax, which kind of question we might have. How can we improve effectiveness by reducing the number of assumptions in our tax plans? How can we track the correlation of our intercompany product pricing to our VAT implications? These are actually very valuable questions and uh, every company needs to be really successful in terms of financial terms, but without a software that can automate them, answering these questions takes forever. Uh, I assume many of you haven't had a, an industry job, so some of these questions might, may not make that much of sense to you, but sooner or later you would be in the job market and you would be in the companies and you see that these questions are really important for companies. And such a software are really helpful, but I know for many of you who, who is, you were a student all of your life, this question may not be that much relevant. And I don't expect you to memorize these. I just want to show you what there's some challenges that each company has in the tax documentations. And with this answer, this question might take forever, but how a software can help you to respond to these questions quickly. Um, these are basically how you can use technology uh, based on the amount of the data and basically maturity of your company. Uh, so if you might end up a startup, which is you don't have that much of advanced uh, transactions, even you can do it manually or you use Excel, that should be more than enough what, versus you might um, end up uh, leaving a last company like Amazon, Walmart. So data visualization and data, big data technology are a necessity. There is no way that you can use a simple software like Excel or even maybe a SQL is not enough. And you should be able to find anomalies. And I'm not sure if you guys have some issues. I mean, sometimes uh, when you do some purchases, suddenly your bank calls you in the address in the United States saying that if you found some anomaly in your transaction. For example, you do all of your purchases in uh, Massachusetts. Suddenly there is some purchases on like, let's say Florida and next hour in California or and next 30 minutes in Wisconsin. So it is, there are anomalies. They have some internal algorithms that show the anomalies. There's no way that they can do manually. There's millions of people are using credit cards, but they might call you said, we are sure that you cannot be in three different states in less than two hours, what happened? Is it you? And in many cases they block the transactions. It might be for a company too, but again, for a case that some of you may not have some industry experience, I should use some examples that makes more sense. 
So anyways, even if you start working in the startup, uh, hopefully the startup would be very successful and uh, each for each step, you should know how you can handle your tax documentation or financial data. Any questions so far? No. Okay. Okay, let's look at this example. Is there any, any of you ever use a Strava fitness app? Yeah, okay. I have. So that's good. Actually, that's a really good, a cool app. And uh, you can share, uh, your fitness activity. I mean, you, maybe you run and, but uh, in this pr presentation that I show in a moment, you can see it might come some issues like security issues for the US military because there's so many soldiers using that app and there is some secured US, um, let's say stations or barracks in middle of nowhere that they are uh, fairly, they should be highly secure but if you are a bad guy or if you are from enemy any enemy country you can use this app and guess where is the u.s secret stations and because of tracking the people so let me show you the video It's just getting loaded. Okay, there is an app. So just wait until it gets finished. Okay, let me see why there is no, okay, let's see here. A US military outpost. In a remote part of Afghanistan, a US military outpost. In the middle of Niger, the outlines of an expanded base and airstrip. In Syria, exercise routines and possible patrolling routes on a base where American special forces train. By design, these secretive locations are supposed to be difficult to spot. But a heat map posted online by Strava, a company that tracks people's exercise routes, has inadvertently put these places on public display for all the world to see. Many of the military bases are already well known, like Bagram and Kandahar airfields in Afghanistan. And the material we're revealing here doesn't go beyond anything that isn't already available on the open web. But Strava's platform has drawn attention in a new way to the activity of military personnel in far-flung outposts and has laid bare some loopholes in the security of military bases. How did this happen? Strava is an app and social network that connects with devices like Fitbit and is used to log workouts. It's popular with US soldiers and others stationed abroad, and the Pentagon has distributed several thousand of them to its personnel. They use it to track their exercise routines and everyday activities, like walks or patrols. But it also tracks users' locations, and in November 2017, the company updated a map showing over 1 billion activities and 3 trillion GPS points. 20-year-old international security student Nathan Rooser was the first to point out how Strava's map could compromise operational security. The map alone doesn't show the complete picture and its satellite images are outdated, but it does tell you where to look. So by combining it with recent satellite imagery and other reporting, we get a clearer sense of what's happening on the ground. Take this new US Air Force base in Sarin, Syria. The map shows workouts or walking routes, activities that provide a clear blueprint of the base. And by tracing the lines, we can follow soldiers to a newly set up helicopter pad. Here's what else we found. A new compound at a French military site in Mali. Strava highlighted the camp in the first place, and no other mapping platforms had marked the site. These US forward operating bases in Afghanistan. The location of a US drone base under construction in Agadez, Niger. 
and various military facilities in Djibouti, where the US is fighting extremist groups in the Horn of Africa. And there are some mysterious sites that we can't yet identify. An area in the middle of the Nigerian desert, two remote locations surrounded by sand barriers in Yemen, and here's unusual activity in the desert in Mauritania that led us to a suspected military site, including an extended airstrip nearby. Strava also allows users to share photos and workout routes. It's basically Facebook for athletes. This allows everyone with an account to see who is working out where. For example, the king of the camp run at a US military base in Iraq, or the embassy river wall segment in Baghdad's green zone, or the perimeter base run where more than 15 individuals stationed at a US military base challenge themselves. We found photos posted by users from inside military bases and the online profiles of several US service members stationed at one base near Mosul in Iraq. A Pentagon spokeswoman said that this data release emphasised the need for personnel to have situational awareness and it's assessing if any additional training or guidance is required. There are some areas where people presumably are not allowed to bring their cell phones. User activity at CIA and NSA headquarters, for instance, can be seen around the perimeters but not beyond certain points inside the structure. But out in the remote corners of the world where the US military is operating, there's plenty to see. Okay, so as you see, visualization are cool, but maybe sometimes might bring some challenges. Um, but now let's look uh, talk about some good examples. So the first. Uh, basically recorded uh, application of visual analytics was uh, in 1850s in New England, which a physicians uh, use it uh, basically to find the source of cholera outbreaks in England, in London, and save a lot of lives. Uh, I recommend to read the documentation and uh, basically uh, look at the story of Dr. John Snow. But let's look at the video. I think we have time for the video. So let me just launch it. In 1854, In 1854, cholera struck the city of London. Over 600 people died in just a few weeks. Physician John Snow is often credited with discovering that cholera is a waterborne disease and with ending the 1854 epidemic by removing the handle from the contaminated Broad Street pump. The full story is much more interesting. I've been reading about the John Snow pub for years. There it is. Look at that. Right here on what used to be Broad Street is this fine looking uh, pub. There's this very inauspicious sign that says here the red granite curbstone over there marks the site of the historic Broad Street pump associated with Dr. John Snow's discovery in 1854 that cholera is conveyed by water. So that's a really simple summary of the whole John Snow story. And uh, to give you just an overview, here's the story. So it's 1854, it's really hot, and the end of the summer in London, we're here in Soho, which was a very crowded neighborhood filled of tenements with people not of a lot of means, and there were a lot of people crammed into these buildings. You know, many, many people to an apartment, and it's hot and it's sweaty. And the part that you can't imagine looking right now, because it's still, still pretty crowded, it's not that hot, but it's still pretty crowded, 
here the street now is completely clean. We see street sweeping vehicles, we see drainage in the streets, we have sewers. None of that was true in 1854. Instead, the people who lived in these buildings, some of them had cesspools in these little front courtyards, and they would take their human waste and other waste and just kind of throw it out the window into the cesspool or bring it down to the cesspool. And then it would drain wherever it drained. And the street, whoa, was not something that you could easily walk on and keep your feet clean. Wow, that's slippery and disgusting. And so people were used to this kind of somewhat disgusting uh, ambiance. And people thought that when there were terrible outbreaks of disease, especially cholera, that it was caused by the very poisonous air, this miasma that they called it. And the smell from all the poo and all the animal waste was pretty horrible. And it was a pretty sensible theory to think that that could be causing disease. But John Snow, who lived not far from here, we'll go there later, was a physician in London who was convinced that cholera in particular was a waterborne disease. It was not carried in this smelly air. And what happened here on this spot in 1854 was that there was a baby who lived at number 40 Broad Street, which would have been just about here, baby Lewis, who came down with some sort of terrible disease that caused really uh, uh, terrible diarrhea. And I think pretty quickly people realized that it was cholera and that there was going to be another outbreak of this very terrible disease. And people started dying. All right, so what happens? What happened was the waste from um, Baby Lewis and other people who became ill uh, with the cholera, so human fecal matter, mixed with the water supply that was in a relatively shallow well, I believe about 20 feet down under the street right here. And then the cholera bacteria began to multiply, and then people would ingest the water, which provides the human intestine the place where uh, the, the bacteria multiply best. They need, they need a host like that. So anyway, when people ingest this contaminated water, they come down with cholera from which you die in hours to days. And John Snow, who really was looking for a place where he could, unfortunate circumstances as they were, have a very concentrated outbreak of cholera where he could study the origins of the outbreak, was interested in helping the people, but also interested immediately in collecting information about what was going to happen in this outbreak. So he would have come over here to this neighborhood and started canvassing all the people around here to see who was dying and who needed help and what they had done um, to possibly ingest water from the various water supplies in the area. And right here, um, at a location right near this red curbstone, was a source of what was apparently some very clean tasting, uh, sweet tasting actually, water uh, for drinking. Uh, right here, it's called the Broad Street Pump. And it turned out, as he started canvassing the neighborhood, that he realized that most of the people who had fallen ill and who were continuing to fall ill had drunk water from this particular pump. So there were other water pumps in the neighborhood. And one of the things that we'll see later is that in the end, when he put all his data together and he made a map, he had to show that this pump, by walking, was the closest to almost all of the people who eventually died, 600-something people who died in the epidemic. So even though there are other pumps that are geographically potentially nearer to those people, this one tasted good and was close to the people who died by walking. So in epidemiology today, it's known that one way to really make your case is to have uh, exceptions to the rule. So people who should have died, who didn't die, and then people who did die for no apparent reason. And so John Snow in his work actually found both of those kinds of exceptions. And so one case is uh, what people sometimes refer to as the people who were saved by the beer. And so these were the brewery workers who worked a few blocks from here and drank mostly beer and so had a clean supply of things to drink. And the other case was the workhouse that was near here. And these were the most indigent uh, potentially people in the, in the poorest of health. And so why did they live? They systematically survived this epidemic. And part of the reason, the main and most important reason, is that the workhouse had a well, had its own source of clean drinking water. So there are the exceptions of people who should have died and didn't die. And then what happened was he also found out about a family who would bring water to a member of that family who had moved far, a couple miles outside of this neighborhood. And they brought her some water, an elderly aunt. And she and, and her niece drank it. And those people both died. So to us, looking at modern epidemiological methods, Jon Snow had plenty of evidence to say that this water from this well 
contain the contaminant that caused the disease. But it still took actually many years until uh, the locals believed his story. And another thing that we should mention is that Jon Snow did not collect all this data himself. If you look around the street here, you'll see that this is a very busy neighborhood with lots and lots of people. And I think it was even busier in 1854. But it was a small, contained community. And there were people, for example, like the, the uh, curate, uh, Henry Whitehead, who was a local, who kind of knew everybody. And so Jon Snow worked with Whitehead and with other people in the area to, to really canvas the information and collect the kind of sociological demographic information that he needed to know who lived where, when they died, where they likely got their water, who they talked to, who they came in contact with, all kinds of other details about their personal lives. And so that kind of human data collection in this tightly knit community was also really, really important. So as you just saw, visualization could be very helpful. In this case, save uh, lives of people. And you know, at that time, the health science was not that much ad advanced. So they couldn't see bacteria. They couldn't see what's the reason uh, scientifically. But they, uh, uh, Dr. John Snow used visualization and find the reason and after start removing that well or closing that well uh, uh, they stop uh, cholera that's pretty interesting so again in your company you may not see you may not know the, the actual reason but you can find the source of the reason and uh, it's why visualizations are uh, getting more and more important because they help you to make good decisions in a short amount of time. So otherwise, if Dr. Johnston never used uh, visualization for cholera, I mean, instead of 1,600, maybe 60,000 people could die in like years until they can find, they can invent microscope and they find, oh, this is, it's not the A one, this is, this is a waterborne as, uh, causing because of some, uh, I mean, a certain uh, bacteria. Can anyone tell me another example of using visualization for uh, in the healthcare or in the healthcare domain? Johns Hopkins has one for the COVID pandemic, or they have a lot, but they've been kind of leading the charge on um, tracking the data and doing visual, visual visualizations. Um, during COVID? Yeah, John Hopkins had a good one. So basically, uh, let me just find it. Yeah, they use visualization to find, to show you the issue, I mean, the COVID cases around the country, uh, what part of the country is doing uh, better and what um, in what part of the country we have more issue. Let me just show you the John Hopkins website. I hope you can see. Yeah, total cases in the whole the world is 160 million, almost 170. So as you see, right now, look at China. China is, I mean, some people believe this is a sort of from China or at least the first outbreak happened in China. But look at now, China is doing very well. I mean. India seems getting to tr some troubles. It's US is still in trouble. I mean, Australia, Canada, but by the way, there's not that much of people living in Canada or like uh, in Arctic. So let's look at the US. So it's very intuitive. So in the center of the United States, there's not that much of people, so less COVID cases, but uh, just let me go to Massachusetts area. Yeah, 
it seems in the Western Massachusetts, there is a low number of cases. So let me see if a better region. I think that now there is a, there's not that much of cases, but if I show you this visualization last year, you see so many larger seekers. But I mean, let's say you're working online, you don't have to live in Boston or Worcester. Maybe you go, can go to west side of Massachusetts, which you pay less for rent and you work online. So who cares you, where, where are you? So maybe in the eastern or center of you, almost center and east of the Massachusetts, there's more cases. You can move to cheaper places, which has lower number of COVID cases. So you might live in a more peaceful situation. So US. Let's see if I can change the time. So I think they changed it a little bit. So I'm not sure how can I show you maybe what happened like two months ago, but I think it's the, for the most current situation right now. Yep. Or for the New York, state of New York, as you see near New York City, we have a lot more cases than like up uh, upper state in New York somewhere here. So near border, there's not that much of cases in New York is much more expensive and like you should pay a lot of for rent. But if you work online, you can move, even you can stay within New York, but the state of New York, but maybe you go near Syracuse or which is a good city or Buffalo, I think it's near Niagara Falls, whatever. So you pay less uh, rent and you're in much healthier situations. Okay, let's look at the beginning of the outbreak uh, in China. So as you see, this visualization shows, uh, I mean, uh, in Wuhan, there's a lot of cases like in January 24th, I, to, I mean, the January of 2020, more than one year ago. So although Beijing and Shanghai, like Beijing is here, Shanghai I think is here, I'm not, maybe I'm making a mistake, it's like Southeast of China. More people live, but there is more cases in Wuhan. So is the reason uh, Chinese government had a really good job in the uh, blocking inter, internal transportation. I think they blocked Wuhan for one month, right? I mean, the, is there any Chinese flows here that can't uh, uh, correct me? How long Wuhan, Wuhan was closed? Do you guys remember? 74 days. 74 days. Yeah, it, there is some uh, questions uh, about uh, some issues of closing, but at least if you uh, just show you the John Hopkins maps, no, I mean, anything that they did was effective. So China is really in good situ uh, shape right now in terms of COVID. But at the beginning, they found this source of the problem and they just closed. Uh, I mean, they blocked the whole of the state and especially the city. And now they're really in good situation. Okay, this figure comes from your uh, optional reading. It's a below sum, the below sum analytics talent pool and uh, an overview of analytics ecosystem is uh, basically a chapter of the book. And you can see, see the ecosystem. So as you see, it includes so many sections like data services, analytics sections, data generation, data management, data warehousing, uh, the policies, and basically developing the applications. So as, it's, as you see, the first layer is how you interact with the user, how you uh, basically generate or gather the data and how you manage it. In this second internal level, you, you look at basically uh, policies and uh, 
like first level of analytics and in the core is the analytics. So for using analytical tools, you first need to uh, basically gather the data, manage it and make it ready for analytics. In the analytics program, MSPA program, you guys, uh, I'm not sure which semester you are in, but you get knowledge of data management and like how to re store the data, how to make effective policies. And when you have your rate, data ready in the core, we do analytics. So analytics is not an independent part of it. your system or basically your institution. You need some steps ahead of time to gather and prepare the data. So again, what comes in my mind or your mind, uh, basically, if you end up working in a company, they need some prerequisite to, to, to be able to do visualization, to do, be able to do predictions. Basically, data need to be uh, gathered and refined for you. So, and or maybe you learn those knowledge and you make them ready. This visualization just show you the software and technologies in the uh, big data landscape. By the way, as I, we talked earlier in this semester, we are in the big data era. There is so many technologies and uh, basically knowledge that you need uh, to attain. From this large picture, we give you the most important and uh, trending technologies. For example, Python, and later we talk about uh, big data management. So I teach you, I teach Hadoop Spark, which is uh, this section of the figure or this part. Uh, and also some part is about like some simple analytics, like uh, data management and like for example, using Amazon Web Services, so on and so forth. In whole of your program, you learn the most important part of this figure. You don't have you don't have time to learn all of it, and they are not necessary. You may end up working in a company that you need some of it, but for sure, by the end of your program, you learn the most important part of this figure. Hopefully, at the year graduation, you can talk about this figure. Okay, let's talk about your reading. So this was from your book. It's, a, uh, it's about uh, the challenges that Sirius XM had and how they uh, could respond to the challenges and be successful in their business. Okay, let's, let me ask you, uh, is there anyone who can answer first question? What does Sirius XM do? And in what type of market uh, does it conduct? its business. Um, yeah, so Cirrus is a satellite radio company. Um, in the book, it said that they're the largest radio company in the world with 3.8 billion in annual revenue. Um, and with a wide range of popular music, sports news, and entertainment stations, um, much of the company's growth came from arrangements with the automobile manufacturers um, and the cars that enables Sirius, Sirius to get uh, bigger and grow as a company. Um, the company expanded into internet, smartphones, and other services and distribution channels like uh, JetBlue and so Sonos, I believe. Yeah, very good. So second question, what were challenge? I think you had answered the, uh, some challenges, but what, are, what, uh, what were the challenges? coming on both technology and data related challenges. Who wants to answer the second question? Probably everything comes in your mind is correct anyway. <laughs> um. I guess I can go again. So the I, the demographics of the buyers were changing. I believe they're younger, mm -hmm. um, and then the there are changes in market penetration. So um, so that was something that they wanted to address. Very good. 
So other people, I mean, you can uh, basically, uh, I mean, she could get all of the credit, but I think some of you could uh, basically answer the question and it accounts for your class uh, participation. And no worries for the answers. I mean, I, I don't think there's a wrong answer and because these questions are kind of subjective, but you can answer it based on your reading. Okay, third question, what were the proposed solutions? So the main thing that they were trying to do was moving away from just like a one size fits all like advertising push mm -hmm. where it's just, and then, then they're trying to get more into targeting their ads. So for like people, specific people would want to figuring out who would like what specific types of radio stations and stuff like that. And figuring out how to say, you can listen to this thing instead of just here is XM radio as a whole. Yeah, that's and really I mean, it's not necessarily unique to this industry, but it is something that they did, or at least they wanted to do. Yeah, that's uh, that's correct. And also later they talk about uh, some integration and like make it in-house solution for the marketing purposes. That's very really good. How did they implement the proposed solution? Did they face any implementation challenges? Um, they decided to bring all the things, uh, the work in house. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, but uh, generally speaking, when you uh, bring some in house uh, solution, you need some trainings and also you need to change some uh, some part of your company's environment. That's good. Uh, what were the results and benefits? Were they worth the effort or investment? Who wants to answer the fifth question? Yeah, so the, it looks like they um, shortened their uh, time to get results so that they could get them almost instantly instead of uh, waiting to get them and analyze them and figure it out. Um, so that allowed them to uh, act on the results a lot quicker. Yes, correctly. So, mm -hmm. go oh, ahead. I was, sorry, I was going to add on that they um, also made seamless interactions with the application and they were able to conduct uh, real time communication with customers. Really good. Yeah, they invest more and basically, I mean, uh, the results should be their first goals. I mean, they could uh, basically. Uh, target, I mean, they could make better marketing. I mean, they can do analysis much faster and make more fruitful decisions. Okay, last question. Can you think of other companies facing similar challenges that can potentially benefit from similar data-driven marketing solutions? I think you can uh, tell me names of so many streaming companies, right? One of them is Spotify like Apple, Tidal and stuff. They also have the same kind of music genres and, and, and I think they're doing similar things like what uh, Sirius FM is doing, like podcasts and stuff. So now they're going into more into that instead of just having music. So people on the long distance, they just get so tired of music. They just want to listen to people talking and, and now the new hype is on the Meghan Merkel and, and the Duchess of Sussex and yeah. all the stories and stuff. So podcasting is one of the things they're trying to do. Yeah, I look at the um, their interview with Oprah. That was really a big hit. So anyway, I'm not sure how British monarch would answer uh, respond to that uh, interview, but it was really good example. Thank you guys. I mean. Your questions were very, uh, your answers were really good. Okay, so, so in the, mostly in the second part of this course, which is for prediction, you need to remember or re, uh, remind some statistical concept. For example, I just to drop an example here uh, because, you know, uh, statistics are uh, actually very useful in prediction section when you want to talk about some 
descriptive statistics, or even use it for prediction. So just you don't, I don't uh, basically uh, grade you based on your statistical knowledge. It's not a statistics course, but if you remind some core concepts, that's more than enough. For example, about normal care, uh, confidence interval, like in this figure, uh, is talking about uh, proportion of your data within one standard deviation from mean, which is 68% to sun division 95% and for third the sun division 99%. So just review those concepts and hopefully you won't have any issue in the second part of the course, but it's just a heads up for that section. So I show you a figure about the uh, ecosystem of analytics. So as you see, uh, for in each level or each tier of the ecosystem, we might have different people that do interaction. For example, first level is for data uh, gathering. Uh, we have technical staff that organize, summarize, and summarize data. They send the data into data warehouses. So there's some business users or uh, people who do business analytics like you guys. So you reach those data warehouses, you manipulate data and do make some results. Then you report to management level. And basically some part could be prediction, visualization, and they can make some informative decisions. But what is a data warehouse? Let me read from this uh, definition. A physical repository where relational data are especially organized to provide enterprise-wide cleans data in a standardized format. So first of all, uh, it's a relational data. Relational data is something like uh, SQL or access or even an Excel sheet. So, you, that is on row and for, uh, columns. So it's a relational data, enterprise-wide, so everybody in your enterprise could access it. It's cleans. Not completely, but at least there is some standards and cleanness associated with that. So may, let's talk about relational data, which might be more qu questioning for you. So I said data in row and columns are relational. Uh, it's a very simple um, the explanation, but because let's say you have now you have social media, or you might use Clubhouse, which people talk, people might uh, basically do post pictures or make some videos and share it, or in your company maybe they just write on a piece of paper. So video, sound, pictures, so or other things, they are not in rows and columns, but they are data. Later in your program, you learn how to use the data, how to use, or social media, how to use it to do some analytics. So that those data are not relational or tweets. Um, Twitter data is it just a piece of text? And it's not in row and column. So each people just put some comments and like uh, share some post. But there is a way to process those data. We call and you need to learn some advanced techniques to be able to process non-relational data such as text, video, images, so on and so forth. But in this course, you don't have to. So all of the data that you get exposed uh, are basically relational data. They are in rows and columns. Let's look at the history of uh, data warehousing. So in is a certain 1970s, we, we had large mainframe computers. Even uh, Right now, I think most of your cell phones has at least 64 gigabytes of data. But at that time, 
five megabytes, which is like maybe 1000 times less than your cell phone, transferring five megabytes of data, it might take forever. So it was as heavy as a large man. And it was in the large wooden compartments that they need to travel. They need to send it through trains or trucks. Right now you can send gigabytes of data instantly. Later in 1990s, uh, we, the computer processing power got much more stronger. And we could have a central data storage, which works as your data warehouse. In 2000s, uh, era of analytics was born because you were able to gather and store your data in a central location. And also, is, uh, we, we you see some uh, new companies that provide SaaS or PaaS as a service as a, uh, for the business. Uh, and also platform as a service. Also cloud, cloud computing comes uh, into business. So by the way, just let me stop here. So um, th there is some companies that provide cloud computing right now. If you're an entrepreneur and you think you have a good idea of uh, that needs to process big amount of data, you can do it through Amazon AWS. There's a free version and also uh, but you, you, you can pay for more advanced computations. Uh, I've had some students last year that they are they work in some startups. So if you have a startup, I think you can apply for 100k, 100 thousands of dollars. So 100k computing power from Google. Maybe you can, you should share some part of your profit. But if you have a good idea, uh, and for a startup, Google would uh, support you and pay, I mean, support you with the computing power. So you don't have to pay for computations. Maybe they can host your app if you are going to invent a good app and so on and so forth. So in late 2010s and after that, we were in the big data analytics. We were able to process non-relational data such as text, social media. Uh, for such a thing, you need to learn some new techniques, such as MapReduce or new technologies uh, like Hadoop and NoSQL. Uh, I don't want going more in depth because we have a course that we talk about big data analytics completely. But just keep in mind, uh, whatever you do in this course is in 2000s. There are really hot topics. But your data is limited to your PC. You don't have to use a, cert, a specific infrastructure. So all you do was already invented in this area, 2000s. Just 10, near like 20 years ago, that is still very uh, useful, very competitive, and very interesting. But later you would understand that for large amount of data, I'm talking about Twitsat or Facebook comments, Amazon transactions, uh, Google search. Like Google doesn't use a simple computer like what you have for uh, basically managing the Gmail or like your searches. They have a certain infrastructure to support that, which is like over, uh, they are over Hadoop ecosystem. Any questions so far? So if today is a little boring, but no worries. From next in next class we have a lab, so we get back to hands-on experiences. So we talk about data warehouse, which is a center that you record your central data in your institution. But each part of your each part of the institution or company might have their own database. We call them data marts. Some data marts are dependent 
uh, basically they are just a snapshot of a data warehouse. So they just show a part of data warehouse that is needed for your business, or they could be independent. So they are designed for a strategic business unit or department. So they are not in, in the constant transaction with the data warehouse, but they might report to data warehouse. But just these are just some jargons saying that we have a data warehouse in the center of the institution and some data marts for each unit. So here uh, you see the uh, generic uh, data warehouse framework. So data comes could come from ERP enterprise resource planning, legacy, polls, or other systems. Uh, then through ETL process that is, uh, stands for um, uh, enter, transport, and load, or transpose and load, basically just means you get the data from these data sources and import them into your data warehouse. And then as you see different sections of your company, you might have some data marts that they either uh, have a constant transaction with your uh, data warehouse, or they just might report at the end of the day. And for, because uh, that is very important, usually we have a, some replications of data warehouse somewhere. And you, there's another term metadata, basically just explanation of the data. So for example, what, uh, what each column means. So you might have some variables, the descriptions could be in the metadata. So later those variables and tables might make a lot more sense. And uh, just keep in mind for your project, you might read some websites that give you some uh, tables of variables. Uh, I, you need to write a professional report. So don't just say V1, V2, like, the, like just your names. You should look at the metadata and find the meaning of each variable and it's a part of your report. So for us, just doing simple visualizations and like prediction is not enough. You need to do some insightful uh, investigation that for that purpose, you need to read the metadata and understand what uh, about your data. Okay, so this is just a general uh, data warehouse architecture. So as you see, it might be a three tier architecture, which is uh, you have a client workstation and you have an application server that interact between you and a server. In the two tier architecture is for less amount of transactions. So you have a workstation then which communicate with the database um, directly. For the, for the three tier architecture, we can talk about Amazon. So in your, in your laptop, your cell phone, your computer, you make an order. There is a server that reach to Amazon database, read the data and deliver to your workstation. The second one, which is 2T architecture, usually for uh, when you work in a company, inside your company, your computer connect to the database directly and get the data. Can anyone guess how one tier architecture works and when you when you have it? Probably when your database and your work session are same. For example, when you want to learn SQL, uh, you use you install, I mean, the server on your own system. So basically, your work station and database server and application, all of them are in the one computer. So the one tier architecture is usually for learning, or for the companies that are not very large or a business, a small business, for example. Let's say you have um, a small store, 
a corner store. So in your corner store, maybe you have a database that shows how much you sell, how much you have in your inventory. So you can use just one computer that has a database that you can record your sale and your tax or other, your even, even inventory. So this is search it depends on how large is your business and what you do. Is it Amazon, it's just a small company or it's just maybe a corner store somewhere. I think that should be fine. All right, let's talk about different, uh, basically, uh, schemas. These are just two giants. No worries, there's not that much. So we have a one, is, is, uh, we have a star schema. Basically, you have a main table that other tables can connect to it and get the data. So if you have database course, probably it makes more sense. So they might have some IDs that connect tables to each other. In a Snowflake schema, you have a main table connect to other tables that they are connected to other, other tables. So these are, you might remember there's a, it should be a unique key in each table that connect those tables together. If you, don't, you haven't had database course, by now, that should be okay. You don't need to uh, know it. It's just a review of that concept. Uh, you can, if you're more interested, maybe you can Google about the schemas and how they work. But this is just a recap, a review about the schemas that we might have. Okay, so I think I talk about the source of the data, software as a service. Now let's talk about data lakes. So data lakes is just a permanent repository of the data. So you dump everything in it and you don't do transaction with it. So for example, um, let's say, let's talk about even Amazon. So for each transaction you connect to a database, they check the inventory, the, the price and how does it take how much does it take to get you so but maybe in amazon if you reach like what how uh, how they sell some product five years ago they are not available in their website so some amazon pages are expired because there is no product i mean, there is no certain some certain products may uh, may not be protected anymore and so, but they keep the record of all of the sales even from 20 years ago in somewhere. So left, later if they need, they can reach to that website, that database. We call it data lake. It just means um, the, for the record, they have a database, but for their business, they don't do transaction with, in it. So data warehouse should be very fast because it's related to business data like no. They don't need to be fast. They are just a big repository that you dump everything in it. Maybe in future, you need to do uh, some historical study or some maybe some crime happened that you need to look at them. So they need to keep a record of it. Uh, data warehouse is kind of mature technology. It's about more than 20 years that uh, most of companies are working, but data lakes are pretty new. Uh, since data warehouse are for day-to-day -day transactions, they should be designed very secure, but this is not the case uh, for data lakes. And the users of data warehouses could be business professionals or even data scientists, uh, because they can do some prediction and do analysis, but data lakes is mostly for data scientists. Maybe they, they can do some antical processes over historical data they can reach to data lake. Another concept is balance the scorecard. This is a review. So um, like it's, it's, ad, uh, it's devised for the cases that you might have some subjective idea uh, like Let's say you want to buy a car, 
for you color, comfort, maybe like technology that they use and um, maybe uh, how luxury is it is important to buy a car. So in that cases, you cannot quantify comfort in terms of money, or you cannot say this is a luxury brand, so it costs $200. So for such a case uh, that we might have, we, we want to make a decision about subjective matters. Usually one of the good methods is balance the scorecard. So we give a weight to some subjective uh, uh, dimensions and then make decision based on the weights versus like sometimes you might run a company, I mean truck company, and you want to transport some goods. You, you don't look at that much of the prestige of the brand or luxury or other thing. You look at uh, cost, like mile per, uh, like dollar per uh, ton. So how economical is your uh, truck? So in those cases, you have an objective measure to, uh, to uh, for your business, but for many cases, we, we just have subjective ideas. So you, you should use some some methods to justify our options. So why you buy a Toyota or why you buy a Tesla? So yeah, uh, most likely you have a subjective matter. So how you, you basically make decisions based on subjective inputs. Okay, next class, uh, I talk about dashboards. It's, as you see, it looks like a car dashboards. In car dashboard, you get the information about like your speed, your uh, engine, uh, engine speed, or your gas, amount, remaining gas, temperature, so on and so forth. It, it, you get a stream of the data. Uh, dashboard, uh, make it more simple for you to process. So next class, we learn how to make dashboards in Tableau for our business and how you process the stream of the data constantly. So hopefully the next class is more interesting for you and then make your Tableau ready for the next class. Any questions? Yes, Professor. Well, for the project proposal, should we use a poster, poster format or PowerPoint format as well? I think, uh, no, it's uh, for the hackathon competition or any, comp let's say for the informs, you should make a poster and explain your research. I just provide some example of good, um, not, not that much good presentations that you can make. So, if there is a poster competition, it's the format that you need to do. For your first delivery, I think I put the format. So how you need, to, you, you, it's just a write-up. So you write your passion, a little of introduction, the data that you want to use, and description of the that. So uh, for such a you don't have to make a poster. Maybe just one page is enough one page of your award document is enough. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. Okay, so since it's online uh, class, I cannot see your faces, but if you have other questions, you can reach me during office hours, or I recommend also post over group me, so because your questions might be your friends' questions, so you help them a lot. Most like, mo many times I get same questions from like five or 10 people. That's okay, I respond to your emails. I don't say don't send me email, but I think it's more efficient if you post over group me, but if you are more comfortable for email, that's totally fine too. Anyway, thank you very much for today. So see you guys on Wednesday. Have a good rest of the day. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, thank you Professor. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, Professor.